The gold price has been on a tear. Gary Wagner, editor of thegoldforecast.com, joins us to break down what happened and what's happening now and what will happen next. Gary, good to see you, my friend. Welcome to my show. Happy to speak to you today. So glad to be here and uh, really, really excited about what's ahead on the David Lynn Report. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for joining me and our audience would really appreciate your insights on what's been happening with gold. I'm just going to cut to the chase. My very first question, the question everyone in the gold market is thinking right now, is this momentum that we've seen, is that going to continue? Are we about to see new all-time highs soon? Well, the answer, short answer is yes. As you know, uh, right before the end of the year, my prediction was a new price high by the end of the year, and I was looking as high as 2300 I'm looking now probably at 21 to 2200 by the end of the year. So the short answer is yes, we will see this momentum continue. A counter argument is that the gold market has overextended and it's time for a pullback. Do the technical support that theory? We've gotten really respectable pullbacks when you look at it. Think about the bottom in November, gold touches just above uh, 1600. It runs to about 1760, and then it pivots or corrects to 1718. That was a respectable retracement. Then it runs from 1718 to 1977. That was a nice run, but then it corrected a very nice correction to 1812. So we've seen not only the nice moves up, but the respectable anticipated corrections down. We just got that because we had a solid move from 1813 to that high the other day of 2015. The drop over the last couple of days took us to a low of about 1937. It's a 38.2% fib retracement. It is in alignment with a market that's not parabolic, has a solid upward tact, which means that it's likely we will see momentum continue. When do you think we will see this new all-time high? Well, here, here's the key. I think we'll see it this year. But what is really important is when Powell came out at the last FOMC meeting, he said they raised rates by quarter percent. They also talked about a pause. We're almost ready for a pause. But he mentioned they're probably going to keep whatever level they get to elevated throughout 2023. Remember, interest rates rising is, is a negative influence on gold and inflation is a positive. So what I think is going to happen is we will get a slow and methodical move up. But when the point comes, probably next year, when he does that first rate cut, that's when you're going to really see gold fly to, to numbers that are unimaginable in terms of what predictions were, say, a year ago. Well, can you can you help us imagine these numbers, Gary? <laughs> can we, uh, yeah, can we, we can use our imagination? How high can I, we get? I've got my longest term chart is looking as high as 2,500. To do that, I'm using a very, very long term weekly chart, an Elliott wave count, and I'm projecting my uh, basic FIB extension from 1177 to 2097, and then beginning that extension at 1624, and a one-to-one -one relationship between three, wave three and wave five takes you to $2,544. Now that's the high end. I'm more comfortable saying 22 to 2300 because my daily studies support that, um, and my short-term studies that are done with half-day charts, 780, are looking for 2168, and that's this year. And it could be the second or third quarter of this year. Right. Well, Gary, uh, let's take a look at one of your charts. And uh, I, I like to understand exactly what happened over the last month and some of the key drivers, both from a technical and fundamental perspective, that help support the price of gold to current levels. Okay. Um, there is a chart that I've just put up. It is in Henkin Ashi format rather than in standard candlestick in conjunction with my Elliott wave count. Let me just move that over. Um, and the reason that I like to use the Japanese average charts or Henkin Ashi charts is they take the noise out of the market. And so when I do a hand wave count for Elliott wave, it tends to be solid green on the impulse or waves that are moving in the um, 
primary trend direction, which is up right now, and the corrections are, are drawn in red, and you don't get as much noise, so you tend to get solid green, solid red moves up and down, and you also get really beautiful pivots, because, for example, at the chart that we're looking at, at the point that it says number one, when it comes down, you can see these candles right here get very, very small, and then they move to green, it trades sideways, and then the size start to grow. In a Hankinashi, the key difference is the open is fixed off the midpoint of the prior candle, and that's how it's an average, or that's how they take the noise away. You can see that my projections are uh, one to one at $2,069, up to a 1.382 extension, which is over $2,100 per ounce. And that would be the conclusion of the primary fifth wave on this cycle. Okay. Uh, Gary, people have been telling, uh, well, people have been saying that uh, gold has risen over the last month, partly due to the banking crisis that we've seen unfolding. First, it was Silicon Valley Bank, then Signature Bank, First Republic, Credit Suisse now being bought out by UBS. Um, a lot of turmoil in the financial markets, as you know. How much of that played an influence on gold? And how much have, you know, investors are wondering whether or not the drive to safe haven mentality has been the primary driver of this uptrend? I think that it's become a very lar a much larger component once it became clear that there were banking failures um in in terms of the, the credit swiss they got bought out in terms of the ones in the us they're kind of working some sort of a solution out through the fdic and the federal reserve and even biden stepped in on that it remains on our radar I don't look at this as the long term mover that's going to propel gold higher. It will be a huge influence on it. What I think will move gold higher, regardless of whether the banking crisis is resolved or worsens. Of course, if it worsens, it has more momentum for gold. If it's resolved, it takes away that aspect. But it's a fact that if you look at the recent inflationary reports, they are showing that inflation in many sectors is sticky or persistent. The mistake the Federal Reserve made years ago by not raising interest rates when they first popped above 2% in 2021 and waiting till 2022 when they were 8.5% March, it's already 8.5% CPI, they raised it by a quarter percent. They, they face that same dilemma now. In other words, if they're under the assumption that inflation is going to get reduced over time, now they don't believe it's transitory. They believe their tools are working, but A, there is a lag in that. And B, the elements that I believe are sticky are mortgages and the housing market, because by raising rates, it increases the amount you have to pay to get a mortgage that gets channeled through for rentals. And so they have really inadvertently shot themselves in the foot. They knew that this would, would be the repercussions, but if the housing market is, I believe 70% of the CPI, it's a big component. And if rates remain elevated, which he committed that they will, then the market participants, investors at large are going to focus on the sticky or elevated level of inflation and continued high interest rates. And that's going to be the primary driver of gold to the upside. If the banking crisis is not resolved, it worsens, that's going to add fuel to the fire, so to speak. And right now, it's still adding gasoline to it because it hasn't been resolved. They're putting fixes in place, so to speak. Um, I think the, the Swiss bank's not the issue. It's are we going to get other banks that are showing insolvency problems? And that I believe is possible. It's interesting. Uh, let me just pull up a historical chart of gold. Uh, during the last financial crisis between 2008 and 2009, now Lehman Brothers collapsed while well, officially filed for bankruptcy mid-September 2008. Uh, if you look at the price of gold throughout September 2008, it was actually on a downtrend. It, it troughed around October 2008, and it wasn't until maybe after a month of Lehman's official collapse that gold started rising again, um, but not by a lot. 
And if you look at uh, gold throughout 2008, 2009, it was more or less flat during uh, the recession. Uh, now, after the recession officially ended, that's when gold continues spiking all the way up to the highs in 2011. So my point is, Gary, the last financial crisis saw banking collapses. Gold didn't respond as positively, or at least it didn't really react in the same way that it's doing now. Why do you think that is? If you look back at, at our charts that look at the move, say, from 700 to 1,000 in gold, and this is the early days, it wasn't until about 2009, the end of 2009, when we saw it break 1,000 and then move up from 2009 to mid-2011 to the all-time highs. And that was also when we had Federal Reserve intervention, meaning some sort of uh, stimulus, whether it was accommodative rates, they were doing things that brought gold up. Gold tends to sometimes lag behind. In the instance of what we're looking at, it's almost the reverse. Powell made it emphatically clear we're going to continue to raise rates. We're not going to pivot. We're not going to cut rates. And yet the market dropped up until November. In November, he didn't change his tune. The Fed was still ultra hawkish. But yet market participants had the belief or the unrealistic anticipation that rate cuts would uh, soon come out of the Fed. They didn't. And the market still rose because they didn't believe the Federal Reserve had the resolve or the ability to maintain these elevated rates. Now they're convinced, I believe, they've gotten that message. And yet gold continues to rise overall. And that's because even with the elevated rates, the inflation level is not coming down. So they're shifting their focus from interest rates to inflation that continues to be elevated. By doing that, gold is going to be a safe haven place to put your a part of your assets. You know what's most striking to me, Gary? And here's another chart. This is the chart showing the real interest rate. Um, now, the real interest rate is the nominal rate, in this case, the one-year uh, Treasury yield minus the inflation rate. And you, as you can see from this chart that I'll show on the screen, it's been on an uptrend over the last few months. Interestingly, gold, which has historically held a very tight negative correlation with real interest rates, that correlation has broken down because they've both moved in tandem, something that we rarely, if ever, see. This is a significant breakdown. What happened there? Well, you want to add one more variable to that formula. Excellent point, excellent question. And that's dollar strength or weakness. Because the demise of gold pricing from $1,977 beginning of the year down to $1,812 um, that ended the last week of um, February was really driven at that point by dollar strength. And dollar strength was they were front running these moves that were anticipated by the Federal Reserve. The optimism that happened in the, my pivot point is November the 3rd. That's when we hit a triple bottom. And then on November 3rd, it started running. And we saw it run were in a very, very short period of time from there to the highs we saw last week at $2,015. So dollar strength in this case played a stronger, um, I guess, supporting factor to, I, well, dollar weakness, should I say, dollar strength or weakness, but in this case, the weakness played a stronger supporting role in the strength of gold. Um, do you think that the dollar will continue weakening then is the obvious follow-up question. I mean, that's a good question. Obviously, or it's logical to assume it's not, nothing's obvious in this financial market. But it seems to be a logical conclusion that as interest rates go higher, it's an inverse relationship, bonds pricing goes lower, but the dollar gains strength. And what you want to notice is that typically there's a negative correlation, an inverse correlation between gold and the dollar. When gold runs, the dollar tends to drop. However, if you look at long-term historical charts, when the Fed steps in with a heavy hand, you typically get uh, both gold and the dollar running to higher ground in tandem. And the only time it's been, uh, only a few times we've seen that kind of correlation invert. And it has always been when the Federal Reserve was doing something aggressively, whether it was monetary tightening or uh, highly accommodative, that's when you get the two, both the dollar and gold moving in the same direction. So 
it's something that we're seeing and we're seeing it only because the Federal Reserve is so actively and aggressively moving rates higher. And to uh, just to this is a theoretical exercise here, just to challenge your bullish thesis, what could possibly bring gold back down to its uh, lows earlier in the year? We saw, I think, seventeen hundred dollars at one point or just above that. If it were to fall back to that point, or perhaps lower, what are the macro conditions that would need it would be to necessary transpire? for that? Yeah, uh, necessary it's, for that. it's a pretty simple answer. The Fed um, miraculously pulled off a soft landing and took inflation to 2% based on the PCE core. If that happened, now the likelihood to me is remote, um, but if that occurred, that would be the fundamental macro environment that would do that to gold. In other words, that inflation really dropped precipitously and quickly. Okay, now last time we saw gold spike up to its then all-time highs during the um, uh, three years ago in 2020 in August, didn't stay that way for very long. It came down shortly after. Suppose gold were to retrace that high, like you said, uh, can we see a sustained level above $2,100? Excellent question. Um, the first thing that we want to do is to see a sustained level above 2000, build a base slowly, and then make that next step up to 2100. I think that if, in fact, we see it move above 2000 and consistently hold there, the first attempt at 2100, which would be an all time record high, will be definitely met by a lot of profit taking. It won't make it on the first try. Typically, when you hit these, um, key psychological levels that are highs that have never happened or lows that we haven't seen in years. It's tested, broken, tested, broken. Many times it'll take two to three times before that becomes uh, a stable support area on a long-term basis. But it starts by gold prices moving above 2000 on a closing basis and maintaining that for a while and building a base at that area. At that point, we're then pushing to the all time record at 2088. And of course, we came in, what was it last year at 77, about $10 shy, but it didn't hold that. It came down and it came down to about 1800 right then and there. So the first thing we want to see is the market break back above 2000 and hold that level. In the case of what we saw recently, it went to 2015, but then in a couple of days, it went back to 1937. So we have to see gold be able to hold on a multiple closing basis above 2000. You're a believer that gold on most days or most periods is a hedge against stock market volatility. Um, historically, they've moved in opposite directions. Now, the, the correlation is rather inconsistent between gold and the stock market, but assuming that there is a negative correlation, my question to you then is, Gary, how do you think the stock markets will play out over the course of the year in light of everything we've discussed so far? That's a much tougher question for me to answer personally. First of all, I always differentiate when I get a question, where do I think the market's going, is that we have to realize that it's never been a stock market, but a market of stocks. So different sectors will tend to perform well. We've had a lot of selling pressure in the tech stocks that have done so well, but certain stocks such as the energies and um, some of the secondary, the smaller mid cap stocks have performed well. Overall, businesses are affected by the price of borrowing funds to expand. Absolutely. They're also highly sensitive to rising wages if it's a tight labor force. And lastly, they're extremely sensitive to economic growth or contraction. The fact that the Federal Reserve has done the majority of the rate hikes, if they're saying we might, we got a quarter percent at the recent FOMC meeting, we might see one more rate hike and then we're going to pause. Businesses still have to adjust to that higher level in terms of borrowing costs, and that's going to be challenging. Of course, the banks will tend to do well, the, the real solid solvent banks, because whatever uh, the terminal rate is, Fed funds rate is, they're going to get three points above prime. They're not going to loan money for, for no reason. But when it gets systemically high, what they take into account is the default rate goes up because it's harder to maintain those payments for middle-class Americans that are taking out things like loans and using that as a tool. 
So it's going to be challenging with U.S. equities, but it's going to be more challenging for some sectors than others. I understand. All right. Well, Gary, I really appreciate your insights. And uh, the next time gold moves, which I'm sure will be rather soon in today's market, we'll have you on again to give us an update. Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you. And I look forward to our next meeting. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned for more content.